Sandra. I'm the events coordinator for Airloom Next Door. Um, we are collaborating with Helix, this space that is so graciously offered to us. Use this space for events like this when we have more people. If you've ever been to the bookstore, it's quite small. <laughs> you know that not very many people have been in there at once. So we're here tonight. Helix is um, a nonprofit dedicated to helping school aged children gain um, work skills. So this this space used to be a coffee shop where teenagers could come and practice career skills. Um, it's not a coffee shop right now, but they're still yeah, they're still working in the mission of, of helping young people. So that's what Kevin says. That's why I'm here. And tonight you are here for a lecture, and uh, Brian is going to be giving this lecture on the Library of Alexandria. So please make yourself comfortable. Um, I don't have much more intro than that. I really want to let you take it away. But I'm so excited that so many people are coming up tonight. This is great. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Helix, and thank you, um, Marilyn Books. Uh, thank you to the Carl and Tennis family for supporting me in this endeavor uh, to commemorate um, Chelsea's life. Uh, not her family. Not yet. <laughs> um, this was a work of love. Um, it's something that Chelsea and I talked about for um, years about me giving a lecture to help promote her business, um, her new film store, and unfortunately um, that didn't happen while she was with us. So, uh, it's fun. And now I'm going to nerd out. <laughs> So, the Library of Alexandria, um, in Greek, um, it's Biblioteca uh, Alexandrina, um, library, uh, the concept is rather ancient, it precedes the famous Library of Alexandria that we're going to be talking about today. We'll go through a few uh, examples of preceding libraries, specifically in Egypt, which is my format, um, just to give you an idea that this thing didn't just pop up at 9.23 on Thursday morning, right? It was, it was the, the result of a long process of a tradition of knowledge and why knowledge is transmitted and to whom knowledge is transmitted. Um, we're not talking about a public library. We're not talking about you know, going down the street uh, or even going next door to a bookstore. Um, these were exclusive properties that were, in this case, owned by the royal family, the Macedonian Greek family who ruled Egypt. So, um, I hope everyone can see the image, it's not too white out or anything. Um, very romanticized image, one of my favorites. I uh, still haven't found the artist who actually painted this, um, but this is supposedly um, a reconstruction of. Uh, the Library of Alexandria. So we have three books um, that I used um, for this presentation. Um, there are other uh, authors and other publications that I did not include, but uh, this one by Confora, very easily easily read, reads like a novel almost. Uh, it is nonfiction, very good book. The Library of Alexandria. By Euclid is also very useful. Uh, the one on the far right is, um, I believe, still currently out of print. I have a first edition from 1953. It was the only useful thing my ex gave me. Uh, <laughs> I do appreciate that. Um, so these are the these are some of the main sources. Um, we'll be tapping into other online sources that you can go you know, further. So, the first thing that I want to bring up is a um, study by Maurice Halbox, uh, who was a French sociologist, studying memory, specifically memory in the context of cultural and individual memory. Why we remember things that we remember. Why are they important? Why do we get things that aren't so important? How does memory change? So, um, he was a French sociologist and philosopher known to develop the concept of collective memory. 
His ideas are summarized by the four dimensions that he brings up of cultural memory, teaching and explaining the origin of writing, the cohesive power of the written word, cultural identity, and its appropriation. Now, appropriation is a magic word, right? Because especially when we talk about Western appropriation of non-Western cultures and traditions, that's a hot button topic. And it's still something that's being debated in dialogue, you know, we spoke about in, uh, in the society today. So collective memory is the shared pool of knowledge and information of collective memories of two or more um, members of a social group. I would, I would argue against two or more. Just because I have a shared memory with a family member or a friend or my husband doesn't necessarily make them a collective memory. I would think a collective memory would be a larger group. So, with all due respect, you know, Mr. Lovelace, uh, I, I do disagree with that. But I think that this information is interesting. Now, most of us, and I'm here at Wilton, kind of the demography of the group, might remember Coco. Um, she's been gone you know, I think two decades now. Uh, and then, of course, Mr. Fred Rogers. Who's right? the Rogers neighborhood? Yeah. <laughs> and um, as the you know, animal, animal uh, lover, but he encountered Coco, um, who was a low and mountain gorilla, uh, who was raised you know, within the confines of San Francisco, I believe. Um, but she was the study of language and cognition, primarily through American Sign Language. And the next slide that I'm going to bring up is called mimetic um, memory. Basically, are you mimicking things because you're imitating somebody else, like a mind, right? Um, but Coco proved to us in cognitive theory and also in chromatology, that she could actually creatively make sentences. Creatively, on her own, not through, you know, I mean, she, she had a basic vocabulary, but she was able to put those vocabulary words together into some sort of sentence, some sort of pattern. On the far right hand side, this is Coco with uh, one of her earliest kittens, Ball Ball. Um, Coco actually named her Ball Ball, which was a small little ball of puff. Um, and Ball Ball unfortunately got out of the compound. She was hit by a car. She died. Um, and whenever the uh, whenever Coco's trainer had told her that Ball Ball you know, was dead, Coco just she she put her finger to her nose to her, to her cheek and say, "Cry, don't go cry, Ball Ball, Ball Ball, don't go cry." So this cognitive Certainly not cognitive dissonance. I mean, this panel truly understood what was going on. So, how can you apply that to to human cultures? So, let's move to the next one. So, the second one is the memory of things. Um, primary objects such as beds, chair, clothing, tools, cars, and represent concepts of practicality, aesthetics, comfort, and personal social identity. And of course, this first sentence, that's going to be culture, right? Just because we have something that is culturally important to us in the West and America doesn't mean that someone in, say, Zimbabwe has the same sort of cultural aesthetics. And this can vary depending on each gender, gender identity, normativity. So all of these things are going to help us define what the Library of Alexandria was, what was kept, who wrote it, who read it and what was destroyed. The world of things now will remind us of the constant present, but of letter levels of and the dual and collective past. And this ties into our identity as a people, but say um, uh, you know, in, in the Jewish tradition. You know, you, you have you know Sabbath, you have the you know, Torah, you have all of these you know sacred books and then you know, rituals and things, that identifies a particular population that doesn't necessarily translate to other people. That doesn't make them any less important. It just means that that is a different population. That is a different narrative. 
So semantic memory. Um, this is where I, I really like to get into stuff because semantic basically is a fancy word that just simply means meaning. What sort of meaning do you place in an object, in a book, in a person, in a physical location? What does it mean to you? But then also, when does it lose its meaning? Because obviously that's the history of human civilization. We have lost things, like the Library of Alexandria, because it no longer served a purpose of that particular time. Period. So, uh, one of our earliest examples of writing is basically a receipt. Everybody thinks, you know, oh, origins of writing, you know, it must be, you know, these great myths of the gods and, you know, kings and stuff like that. No. It's basically, I'm giving you four sheep, and you're giving me your daughter for my son in marriage. That's the origin of writing. However unsexy it sounds, that's basically what the origin of writing is. First appeared in Mesopotamia. Um, I know many of my Egyptology friends are probably going to hate this. There have been some of finds in Egypt uh, that might you know, contradict this, but um, right now, the one we're going with uh, Mesopotamia. So, Mesopotamian libraries could be divided into three categories temple libraries, which are not uncommon in the ancient world, uh, palace libraries, so basically annals. Um, documents of the king, proclamations of the king, saying, you know, oh, look at me, I'm Ashurbanipal, I'm so great, I'm awesome, look at my library. Um, and then libraries belonging to private individuals, and here's what's interesting, is that these libraries belonging to private individuals, kind of like we all have books, you know, bookshelves in our own houses. Um, these private individuals oftentimes will be confiscated during particular time periods by Mesopotamian and Sumerian cultures to be added into the collective of the royal archives. So basically, if, let's say, you know, the current president or any president in the United States were to suddenly say, oh, Brian Smith, you've got 3,517 books on Egypt. I'm going to confiscate those and I'm going to add them to the Library of Congress. So that's basically, you know, kind of what we're looking for. And of course, it's the king. Who's going to argue against the king? So, in Huidoana, she is one of my favorites from very, very remote antiquity. She was the daughter of Sargon. Uh, she was a poetess. Um, and I thought that it would be appropriate to mention her because, um, of course, you know, Chelsea, not only being a writer, but also a bookstore owner and a businesswoman of herself. This is the first woman that we know, the first individual woman that we know who was not only literate, but held a high position in status in history. Um, she's the first known author. Much of her work uh, for those Assyriologists, people who studied in ancient Mesopotamia and Syria, uh, regard her as being the first person to actually categorize different genres in literature, poetry, songs. In books. So, you know, if, if, if we're looking, if we'll eventually look at um, Kalimikos, you know, the Library of Alexandria, she started, it was her, it was a woman. And that's rare in the ancient world. It's rather actually challenging even today in the 21st century. Um, so, she held the, high, the position of high priestess in the city of Ur. Uh, if you've heard of Ur, it sounds familiar. Uh, that's where Abraham came from. The biblical tradition, right? Or the Chaldees. Uh, she's credited with creating the paradigms of poetry, songs, and prayers, like I mentioned. So here is a small, I believe this is from the National Land. Uh, somebody clicks an email me to correct me, I'm sorry. Um, a small disc where we have in Hodan, here surrounded by supplicants, there is an offering table uh, with flames. Flames? Um, coming up, burning incense, and over here, this kind of, if you can see it, this kind of wedding cake shape thing, that's a ziggurat. It's the foundation of an Egypt, of a Mesopotamian temple, right, the temple is on top. So she's performing her cultic duties 
as not only the daughter of Sargon the Great, but also as a priestess. So ancient Egypt and libraries. Um, believe it or not, I'm not going to talk too much about this. Uh, since the beginning of its history, papyrus was the preferred writing material in Egypt. Um, it was produced in handy sheets, relatively carryable, which um, whatever the writing material, all ancient cultures had repositories for important writings, and the Egyptians were certainly no exception. Uh, buildings, which we can be identified as libraries, are very rare in Egypt. We do have a few inscriptions, I want to show you one of the best known. Uh, the Temple of Horus at Fu, uh, where we actually have a listing of um, the, the collections that would belong to the library, including recipes for incense, like different types of incenses that would be mixed and made in order you know, for you know, special occasions like festivals or coronations. Um, they are generalized conclusions based on architectural evidence and are speculative events. So we don't really have, from Egypt, we don't have a lot of strong uh, evidence of Egyptian libraries. Although we do have strong evidence of an intellectual tradition from Egypt. So the intent of Egyptian libraries. We did this with Mesopotamia, now we're going to do Egypt. There were the of texts serve mainly three purposes. Texts which will be used in the future, so basically an archive, or we traditionally think of a library, you know, so you know, let's save this writing for the future. Um, and this include um, historical annals and accounts of the king, um, you know, uh, other, other cultural events. Text used in the present, textual material used for um, archival and reference purposes, which is written on papyrus, and it's temporal. So basically, Write down what you need right now. The thing is, number two, papyrus was expensive, even though it was abundant in Egypt. Uh, were papyrus, uh, there were literally papyrus farms, you know, that, that were that were uh, made for you know, specifically the industrial use and production of papyrus documents. So if you know, if you're a farmer, you know, or if you're a weaver at home, and you need, more than likely, you're not going to be one of it, right? 5% may be at best 5% literacy rate. So if you can't read, you can't write, you want to record something, like a marriage document, you have to go to the nearest scribe and use a broken flake of ceramic or a broken flake of um, limestone called ostracum. And that scribe, would basically have to copy down what you're saying, either with my gifts and belongings to you know, such and such or whoever. But then you also had to have a lot of trust in that scribe. And we have plenty of mistakes where scribes got it wrong. So is that mimetic memory where they're just copying down some sort of root pre scribed um, uh, text? Or are they actually are they actually consuming the material from the individual? And sometimes um, scribes got it wrong. They either weren't well educated, or they were lied to the person they were writing these you know texts for um, to their benefit. Because at the end of the day, the scribes still couldn't be paid, and the farmer or the weaver or whoever just has to trust that the account is secure. Provisional texts primarily are the ones that we have the most evidence for, specifically on the interior and exterior of coffins from Egypt, as well as uh, the interior and exterior of Egyptian uh, temples and tombs and private memorials. These are provisional in that they evoke the idea of the gods, the afterlife, a sense of judgment. You know, I was the best person in the world, and that is science. Um, so you've got to write that down, right? And record that to make sure that everybody knows that you are the best person. So uh, these provisional texts um, evolve, but again, that's uh, probably another lecture. <laughs> okay, book work. <laughs> so here is the damage to a German text. I uh, hope you can see it. It's kind of pale. It has like these little rivulets of 
the way uh, material. Um, we have this cute little cartoon, you know, emoji. Oh, I'm a bookworm. I'm so cute. I consume books, you know, metaphorically, because I like to read. No, this is the little bastard. <laughs> this is the one who actually eats the material. Um, he, him, her, um, and their larvae actually um, plant eggs, lay their eggs within climates where these insects can thrive. And we even have an Egyptian, Greek, Mesopotamian text where they are recopying um, material that has been worm eaten. And what they're referring to is this specific little thing. Um, and so, um, yeah, when you talk about the bookworm, you know, everybody's like, oh, you're a bookworm, you're a nerd, you know, you're, you're so smart. No, you're literally consuming books. And there's a lot of examples of this from all over the world, not just Egypt, Mesopotamia, or Greece. So, how do we combat bugs? In my household, cats. Our cats love to chase bugs. Um, we live in a building that's you know, probably in the 1920s, 1920s or so. So, you know, even though it's a really nice condo, uh, there are occasionally bugs that will come into the house. Um, you cannot tell me that in all of the millennia of ancient Egyptian history that they didn't have library cats. Even the Hermitage, right, museum in, in Russia, um, has cats, like generations of cats, uh, where they chase down bugs, but they also chase down vermin, mice, you know, rats, anything else that would actually cause uh, harm to the collection. And so, uh, this is actually a friend of mine, Danica. Um, she uh, took this photograph and then used this by permission uh, from her. This is a cat at Philae Island, one of the last temples of ancient Egypt, where there is still a significant cat population. Um, if you love cats and you're willing to donate, because it's an island because of the pandemic, and you get an email account to donate you know, some money to help support these animals. Right now, they don't have um, the medical expertise of someone coming in to spay and neuter the cats. And so that's unfortunate. As cats will replicate like crazy, uh, just like rabbits. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, you keep them unchecked, and pretty soon you have 18 cats. And that's only like in three weeks. <clears throat> so, anyway, um, you can do that too. Um, oh, this is a little small. I'm sorry. Um, so, this is an image of an institution that is best known in. It's actually literal translation is the house of life. And this is where texts were copied, transcribed, and uh, recorded, uh, usually associated with the gods themselves, the king. And so here we have an actual representation, kind of a footprint or a ground plan of the house of life. At the center is Osiris, the god who died and was reborn, so it's kind of a cycle of um, death. Renewal, life, knowledge associated with this. Um, and then, of course, on the third grade, there are also other hieroglyphs and signs, hopefully, you can see, sorry, um, that indicate various other gods and goddesses uh, associated with this house of life institution. So, the house of life was more than a library, it was um, a kind of university. Here, books of all kinds were not only collected and classified, but also written. And hand it down to younger generations, the scribes and priests. Doesn't mean that they actually learned the lesson, right? You know, they get that paper back that has a few lines on it. Yeah. It looks like, you know, somebody stuck a pig and lead all over the paper because there's so much red ink. Um, same thing with the ancient Egyptians, which makes them more few. They made mistakes. Uh, scribal tools. Um, so this is an artist's palette, kind of like uh, the uh, watercolor kit that you can get at Walgreens. Right? Same thing, just little cakes of techniques. Um, this is a tube that has a reed pen that you pull out of. 
palette. And this is the scribal palette. One dish is for the ink, one dish is for the water. This little sachet is actually for the, um, the coal or the, the black powder that is used to paint and or white in a change. All of these tools are still going to be used and relevant for the library of uh, This is the typical chorus. Here's the library right there. Uh, you can see a schematic drawing of the report lot. This is the footprint. The library is over here. Um, it lists several different sorts of uh, uh, books or texts that are religiously. So the emergence of Greek intellect in the simplest terms, humanism is arrives from the Greeks. So humanism, humanism refers to how the Greek part of the literature, the part of the literature, the of the tradition, puts the human experience at the center of events. Think about it this way. Uh, well, let me finish the sentence and then we'll come back. In contrast to the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism and Christianity and Islam, which focuses on God as the center of Greeks didn't do that. Yeah, they had a lot of Greek gods, but is anybody going to take moral advice from Zeus? <laughs> no. So as long as you, you know, burnt incense and paid your homage to the gods, human beings basically allowed to do whatever they want. And that's why democracy was important. It was not a divine theocracy like we have in Egypt or Mesopotamia. The people were able to make their own decisions. Oh yeah, let's go to the temple and, and, and drink wine to Dionysus and get yeah, completely wasted. Um, but the next day, we still have to sit in the assembly and decide and make our decisions about our community. And who are making these decisions? Man, no one. Man, landowning free. Man. So if you were a foreigner or a slave, even if you were an actor, you could not serve as a voting member in the Athenian assembly. So, um, this says a lot about the uh, you know, classical Greece. Um, so, while the Abrahamic faiths see um, seek the divine godly perfection, the Greek humans are interested in how each of us must come to grips with and make the best use of our inherent human imperfection. The Greeks see this struggle as fascinating, tragic, and beautiful. Hence, Greek drama. Right? Greek drama is going to be one of the main focal points of the Library of Alexandria. Um, epic um, poetry, specifically Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, is going to be the linchpin. It's going to be the anchor for so many almost in my mind, too many scholars of the Library of Alexandria. Uh, to the point that, you know, about the 2nd century AD, that's what they were writing about. What is the Iliad and the Odyssey? Correcting, making marginalia, you know, call forms and side notes, you know, into these older translations. It's like, okay, guys, let's, let's move on. Let's you know, start looking at how big the Earth is. You know, or what is the moon made of? Uh, we do have those people as well, but uh, they seem particularly obsessed with, um, with uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So, our founding fathers, if we may call them that, is, uh, are the uh, philosophers Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Aristotle is going to be the most um, instrumental um, in the development of the Library of Alexandria because Aristotle is actually the tutor of Alexander the Great. I love this slide. <laughs> Talk about drinking the Kool Aid, right? You've got Socrates, who taught Plato, Plato, who taught Aristotle, and Aristotle is holding Alexander the Great. And so they're all passing down these kind of traditions of intellectualism, uh, each in their own way. They didn't all believe the same thing. I mean, Plato is very different from Aristotle, and very different from Socrates. But they each are going to have an instrumental part and the foundation of the intellectual institution of the Lyceum, the Academy, Aristotle's Academy in Athens, but also as kind of an um, established uh, founding point of the Library of Alexandria. 
And so we'll just follow up with Aristotle because he's the most recent in history. He also had the most direct influence with uh, Alexander. Aristotle's intellectual range was vast, covering most of the sciences and many of the arts. Uh, so biology, botany, chemistry, ethics, history, logic, metaphysics, rhetoric, philosophy, law, philosophy, philosophy of science, um, physics, poets, uh, political theory, psychology, and zoology. Sounds like a really good time to play. <laughs> Aristotle, stop talking. So, Alexander against the war. Um, otherwise known as, uh, to my husband, Alexander the Smoke Show. Apparently, <laughs> he was a very attractive young man. Um, he was also very ambitious. Uh, at 19, he crossed over into uh, what's in the realm of modern day Turkey to head off and, and um, liberate the uh, Greek city states of western Turkey. Ends up going all the way to Afghanistan and India on a 10 year journey, become conquering the Persian Empire, the rise of the Persian um, and eventually taking over the entire world war. He founded like 23 cities named after himself. And one of those is what? It's Alexandria, Egypt. So here is kind of the meandering, obviously, he did not have Google Maps. Um, here are the meanderings of Alexander as he's chasing um, the uh, armies of Darius III, and also people that were associated with Darius III who were trying to usurp uh, Alexander's power. Um, he did, of course, go down to Egypt before he made all of this nonsense over here. He went down to Egypt, um, was welcomed by the Egyptians. The Egyptians loved Alexander, they considered him to be a liberator or a savior. And then he went to Siva Oasis, where he was proclaimed the literal son of God, the literal son of God from whom he was worshipped in Siva. So, therefore, not only does Alexander have political power, political backing, he has intellectual backing, thanks to Aristotle, but he also has now this divine title of being the literal embodiment of the son of an Egyptian deity. So, this is going to be really cool when he dies. Because he's going to claim, you know, he's going to stay the claim on his body once he's dead. Because the Egyptians, as we all know, they love throwing their bodies into tombs and coffins, you know, and, and worshiping you know, and venerating the dead. So if we're talking about Alexander the Great, when Alexander dies, who's going to get that body? That is a prestige move. It's not a pious move. That is a move of power and politics. And we even have this, we're going to get into the details of it. We have this, this struggle uh, between uh, Alexander's homeland and Macedonia and Alexander's uh, general Ptolemy, uh, who is more than likely, I believe, it's not been pretty, I believe it was his half brother. So um, Ptolemy is going to be Ptolemy's soldier. He's going to crown himself the king of Egypt. And he and his son are going to be the ones who actually build and fund the library of Alexander. Ptolemy was also a, tutor, a, a, a student of uh, Aristotle. And so you know, he's, he's you know, basically basing his claim of, of possible blood lineage to Alexander, being older than Alexander, being a part of the war general of Alexander, you know, followed him everywhere. And so he comes back to Egypt, and what does he do? He actually, um, in Babylon, where Alexander dies, he actually steals the body, uh, the, 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 you know, the entire panoply of, of you know, the catafalque and, and the funerary gear, the body of Alexander himself. And instead of where it was supposed to go, where Alexander was from, Macedonia, he actually steers it into uh, Alexandria, Egypt itself. Securing his own power of, of that country. And Egypt's really rich at this time in comparison to other people. I think there was enough. I mean, Alexandria at that time was a tiny village. I'm, I'm sorry? I doubt if he took his body to Alexandria right on. There wasn't anything there. Yet. It was uh, a small um, village. One, one, of, one of the uh, biographers, Appian, uh, says that he did, but it, it is still conjecture. Three centuries later. Yeah. 
Um, so a computer generated an image of what Alexander Hospital would look like. We have fresh water like the Here, fed by the economic branch of the Nile and Delta, and of course salt water of um, the Mediterranean. This island is called Pharos Island, and this was uh, the location of the famous lighthouse of Alexandria, which is considered to be one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, the plan of Alexandria, considering the size of the screen, you can read this. Um, but we have different districts. Renacotis, here is a small fishing village that was initially just Egyptian. Alright, so no Greeks. It was, it was like, you know, Alexandria's kind of planned out along or around the Renacotis district. We have the Jewish quarter, we have a significant Jewish population in Alexandria that will, for the rest of its history, even today. today. Uh, and then we have this center area, Kingdom of Venice. So, uh, uh, the Brookion district. The Brookion district is the royal quarter. And for this specific map, if you can see it, there's a small rectangle marked Museum. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit later. We're only 30 minutes in, so bear with me. Um, the museum and the library were probably one and the same. So, no different from, say, if you go to the Art Institute downtown on Michigan Avenue. They have archives, right? They have, you know, repositories of things that are not on display. But they also have things that are, are on display. So that's kind of the best estimate that we can get as far as what the museum was. The museum is mentioned a few times, unfortunately. Sorry. Bring the sexy factor in. Only a few times. But we don't know what it looked like. We don't know exactly what it entailed. Now, Strabo, we're going to talk about my pal Strabo in just a minute because I'm loving Mr. Strabo. He gives us one of the more accurate details of the architecture and layout of the library itself and the cities surrounding the docks. Um, you can read this. This is basically the Ptolemaic family line. Uh, everybody's related to everybody. But uncles are marrying nieces, sisters marrying brothers, having kids. That's going to take its toll a lot, right? At the very end, you have these intergenerational ancestral relationships that's going to take a physical and psychological toll on these rulers who are in control of Alexandria. And the last one, who to me is probably the most brilliant of all 320 years of the Ptolemaic family line is Cleopatra the Seventh, Cleopatra the Great. She had a shift there. She was playing a man's role in a man's world when she was a woman. She um, died probably when she was about 40, and it's been you know, romantically presumed that she committed suicide. Um, I would disagree with that. I also have a very close friend, you guys may want to talk about, who um, yeah. suggests that she was actually murdered by the first emperor of the Roman Empire, Augustus, as a political move. Oh. And then postulated or published, published the fact that, oh, Cleopatra was this you know, horrible orientalist queen, you know, this despotic queen. She had children, she was a seductress, you know, she slept with Caesar, she slept with Mark Antony, she had kids. And you know, he basically is publishing this, this statement saying that you know she took the coward's way out by committing suicide. I don't agree with that. I, I, I don't. I have my reasons. But it's another place. Was she in Ptolemy? No, um, she was actually married. She was married to her brother, who was Ptolemy the Fourteenth. But then she had him killed. <laughs> Not uncommon. Well, I understand. Not yet. Not, not <laughs> <laughs> so, Ptolemy Philadelphus, this is the second Ptolemy, right? This is the guy that, you know, can really firmly start establishing the history of the library of Rome. Ptolemy Silver <coughs> was one of the successor kings of the Empire of Alexander. He served not only as king of Egypt, but also the founder of the Ptolemaic dynasty. 
um, which ended with the famous Cleopatra, who we just introduced. Not the introduction of the machines. Uh, so the Serapeum. So the god that Serapis, once the Greeks really took hold and established themselves as legitimate rulers, um, there was a deity that was invented. And this was based off of um, a synchronized deity, ancient Egyptian deity, Asar, or Osiris, and Apis, uh, the bull god, uh, the manifestation of uh, Ta. Now, Ta is, his main site is Memphis, the traditional capital of where kings are crowned. So this was completely a political move on the Greeks' part, saying, oh, you know, we're Greeks, but we're going to kind of combine your religions together and create a new god that everybody can worship, the Greeks and you know, the Egyptians themselves. It didn't go over too long. So at this point, the library was still in its infancy, and Ptolemy um, actually had um, ships that were coming into Alexandria. Alexandria is, you know, thriving metropolis. It's still being built, um, much like you know, what Eric had asked. Uh, it's still being built, it's still developing, it's still growing, but you still have, you know, Egypt is the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. Ships are coming in, ships are going out. And so um, Ptolemy decides, oh, okay, well, if I'm going to establish my rule over the Egyptians and the Ptolemaic kingdom of the Near East, I need to learn what these people are about and to learn what they're studying, what they're reading, what their sacred manuscripts are, what their traditions are. And so, therefore, he starts confiscating from these ships log books, works of literature, papyri, cuneiform tablets from all over the world. And he would actually mark them uh, with a small wooden tag uh, that said Ekphoia uh, from the ships. So basically, he's holding ransom the books that are coming in from these ships, keeping the originals, making copies, and then sending the copies back to the original owners so he can have the originals himself. Um, Ptolemy Silver does this, Ptolemy and his, his son, Ptolemy II does this. Uh, those are mainly, Ptolemy III does it as well. I don't think anybody else does it. Um, so the Serapeum is a small temple dedicated to this god Serapis, this Egyptian Greek god Serapis. And apparently, this early in the game, the library itself, the proper library itself, was so overflowing that they actually had to build a second daughter library away from the piers, away from the docks. And this is called the library, or uh, the daughter library of the uh, So this is Sarah's. That looks like God. Um, this is the foundation uh, and the remaining few blocks of the Sarah Pam. Still look at it today in Alexandria and Egypt. So, Timon of Phileas. So, even this early, you know, 320, 3, uh, 320 to 235 ish, um, even very early, again, to, to Paris' point, you know, how fast did Alexandria grow, how fast did the library grow. This dude, he, you know, was so bitter because Alexandria became the center of the world as opposed to. Athens, that he wrote this. Many are feeding in populous Egypt, scribblers on papyrus, ceaselessly wrangling in the birdcage of the muses. So the birdcage of the muses is the life. Basically, dude didn't get published, and he was just bitter against everybody else who was working. And so he made fun of the library as calling it some sort of gilded cage where all of these scholars were fed, were housed, you know, they, they you know, had jobs, they could do their own work, um, and it was all paid for by the royal house. Not him. So, he was, he was the name. Um, this quote comes from Timon of Phyllis, a uh, Greek poet and philosopher who watched as the greatest poets of his age, set up across the Mediterranean age, right under the patronage of Ptolemy. And the new library of Alexandria was certainly this third cage. It wasn't just completely 
um, competitive struggle. Timon despised these poets and his views as competitive truth. Basically, these, these aren't real scholars, they're not real scribes. They're just sucking up to the king just so they can get, you know, three hot meals and a bed. It's not the so right. uh, Library or the Lighthouse of Alexandria is from the Neo King. I can't remember which one. I fell for it off the internet. Just get, kind of gives you an idea. Now, this monument, this was built under the Ptolemy uh, II. Uh, so, it was Soter's son. Um, it's also completed by Ptolemy III. Um, we're going to throw on Ptolemy's out uh, But this was literally the beacon of the Eastern Mediterranean until you know, the 12th century, when it was finally toppled by an earthquake. Today, the foundation is actually the foundation of an Islamic fort. The remains of the lighthouse of Alexandria still to be found in the Bay of Alexandria. So we have you know, French Egyptology team, uh, marine divers, uh, for several decades now, that have been able to locate the, the doorways and lintels and statuary and sculpture in the Bay of Alexandria, which is not that deep. You know, we're talking maybe 50, 60 feet. So but, you know, in some cases, closer to the shoreline, you can actually see the ruins of the library just by walking along the pier. So, um, that, that just kind of gives you an idea of you know, what lies under the water that we have yet to uh, uncover. Uh, so, Demetrius. Demetrius of Phalaron. We look under the all of this. Um, basically, he fell out of favor. He was, uh, according to Strabo, my dude Strabo, uh, Strabo, Demetrius inspired, was inspired with inspired the creation of the museum um, because he was kicked out of Athens. So he needed a job. And so he went to the court of uh, Ptolemy in Egypt and said, hey, I need a, I need a job. The Athenians don't like me anymore. And so Ptolemy is like, okay, well, come on in. He's like, oh, I've got this really cool thing that I can put on my CD. Let's make a library. Let's have an official established institution of worldwide global knowledge. And so that's kind of what Demetrius is, is known for. Um, so uh, he modeled this after the arrangement of Aristotle's school, the Lyceum, in Athens. So this is how, even though the Library of Alexandria is located in Egypt, it was not an Egyptian institution. Did it possess Egyptian texts? Yes. It also possessed um, Mesopotamian texts, Jewish texts, you know, other Greek texts, uh, possibly even Sub-Saharan African texts. Um, we don't have complete bibliography. We do have a guy who wrote the bibliography. And so that's kind of cool. Uh, we'll talk about kind of those. So the museum contained a pair of tufts, covered walkway. So that's uh, the columns with a roof and these, uh, this gives rise to a approach in philosophy called the peripatetic school, where the teacher would lead his students around through the columns in the shade you know, from the sun to the lecture. So not necessarily a lecture hall. Now they did have lecture halls, and these are called exedra. So that's really the kind of staggered classroom, probably about the size of this room. So an exedra would hold maybe 20 people. The lecturer um, uh, would be talking to everybody uh, and you know, engaging in discourse. Um, the tech school, school is more along the lines of a hey, it's a really pretty day. Let's go for a walk and talk about the meaning of life. So, um, from the letters of Aristeas, uh, this is composed from 185. The library was initially organized, organized by the Demetrius under the reign of Ptolemy the First. Other sources claim that it was instead created under the reign of the son, Ptolemy the Second. Still some debate. It is during this time that remember whenever I said Ptolemy the Second was appealing to all of these different nations, you know, bring me your books, you know, 
I'm just smoking books in the harbor anyway, so you might as well bring them to me. Um, he wanted the book, he wanted the, the holy book of the Jews. And so he imported 70 Jewish scribes, put them in individual chambers, and had them translate from the ancient Aramaic, at this time it was Aramaic, it was ancient Hebrew, ancient Aramaic into Greek the words of the Septuagint. So part of you know, the Old Testament, basically. And after 70 days, 70 scribes in 70 little separate chambers came up with the exact same translation, which means to labor scholars that proves the divinity of the word of the Bible. And so this happened at Alexandria. So tell me a little bit simply. Yeah, I can give you some indication about family relations. Um, he was king of Ptolemy Egypt, uh, son of Ptolemy Soter and Derenike. Uh, he was recorded by Pliny the Elder as having sent an ambassador named Dionysus to the Mori court uh, in India, possibly to India's first emperor Ashoka. And we actually have Greek inscriptions in India talking about this. So that kind of gives you the broad scope of you know the influence of Alexander and still interconnectedness <laughs> of the Greek world, the Mediterranean world, and Asia. Uh, Ever heard of the city of Kandahar? It was originally Alexandria. Kandahar, back in Alexandria. And it's still thriving the city today. Um, Alexander's, uh, Alexander's uh, exploits helps to cement and connect older trade routes um, on both land and sea that we now call the Silk Road. So bringing China, Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, even closer to you know, the ancient Mediterranean, the um, of coast of Malaysia, once say you know, eight years ago, maybe um, there was a small shipwreck, uh, not really uh, very well preserved, but there were ancient Roman coins from the second century AD in Malaysia. So that kind of gives you the kind of global compass of, of you know, the world that the library was founded in. Uh, so, the museum. The museum is basically a temple of the muses. The muses are here, I'm not going to talk too much about them. Uh, you can Google them, they're really cool checks, very chill. Um, they are the daughters who embody the arts, sciences, literature, poetry, and music. And so the museum, as it's called in Greek, Comes the museum in the modern day vernacular. So here we have Calliope, Clio, Erato, Eucanthe, Melopone, Polyhymnia, Terpsichore, what the name? Terpsichore. It sounds like a spice that we do. Half gram of Terpsichore. Thalia and Urania. Um, and yeah, Urania, the use of astronomy. So sciences were being pursued, arts, literature. Um, Aristophanes was the dude who, you know, in Alexandria, you know, he had heard this, this you know, kind of myth that further south in the city of Aswan, the very, very bottom of uh, modern-day Egypt, a uh, very important city, very important cultic city, even in the Greek period, he had heard that on a specific day, there was a well in Asyut that at noon the sun would shine down and there would be no shadow cast inside the well. So he used trigonometry, geometry, and all of his mathematical magic mystery um, to basically calculate okay, I'm in Alexandria, it doesn't have a moon, right? The sun still casts shadows, but in Asyut, doesn't cast shadows. So I'm going to send basically the equivalent of graduate student down to Asiut, right, to make these recordings on this specific day that he had heard of. And then from the travels of this grad student, from his location and origin in Alexandria, Aristotle 
was able to um, estimate the circumference of the Earth. And he was only a couple of hundred miles off. Again, I'm one. <laughs> Uh, these are some of the notable author sites, really, really small. Um, I will provide my email or the chat, you know, the QA, or email that you guys want to discuss. Um, so, Castidius, Archimedes, the father of engineering, Aristarchus of Samos, first, uh, was the first peculiar central system of the universe. Sorry, Galileo. Uh, <laughs> Telemachus, noted poet, he was the father of bibliography. He was the one who finally said, okay, we've got all of this material in the Library of Alexandria, how do we organize it? Because there are going to be people who want to read some things and not other things. What do they do? So he starts organizing his list called Panakis, which is a Greek word that just simply means lists. So he was the first bibliography. He went through the entire collection at his time, went through the entire collection of the Library of Alexandria to write down the uh, alphabetically first the author's name, Second, the title of the work, and third, a brief synopsis, like two, three sentences, a brief synopsis of what the scroll contained. So, um, Eratosthenes argued for a spherical Earth. That's the guy that I was talking about. Uh, Euclid, father of geometry. I'm sure that you've probably been frustrated by him before. Um, Herophilus, noble physician and founder of the scientific method. Still used today. Um, Hipparchus, founder of trigonometry, also another person I'm personally angry at. I'm not there now. Um, Pappus, he was also a mathematician. And then Hiero, Hiero, father of um, mechanical engineering. Hiero actually created a sculpture out of bronze that um, was a woman who would actually tip over her arm. And the wine would be pumped in from her into the wine goblet to make it ma magically look like it was filling the wine on its own. He also engineered doors and gateways based on the hydraulic system so that that way a pious member of the community approaching a temple, the doors would actually open as if on their own, a divine will. Smoke and mirrors. It's just like, you know, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain and the wizard of Oz. It's exactly that. But he did it with ingenuity. He was one of the earliest of um, no, and there could have been others. We just don't have those texts. We don't have those materials. So again, the library, the museum, probably and the central located parts of Alexandria. To the rival library. I'll talk briefly about this. So, in uh, Asia Minor and Western Turkey, there was Asia Minor and Western Turkey, there was a city called Pergamon. And it was a very wealthy, powerful city belonging to one of uh, Alexander's other generals, Atalus, and his family. And so, considering how much attention Alexandria is getting and how much wealth is pouring into Alexandria, Atalus says, okay, well, you know, we need to have a royal library too. But then the Egyptians, the Greek Ptolemies, they decided to put an embargo on papyrus saying papyrus could only be used and made in Egypt and not in support. So Pergamum kind of ticked off the librarians and the royal family. They started creating and um, utilizing um, parchment. And that's one of the reasons why Pergamon, uh, the word for parchment is Pergamon. Um, and so um, parchment had been used you know, for decades, but they really had the market, they had the monopoly on parchment because the Egyptians refused to give them patterns. Um, if you don't know what parchment is, it's also known as vellum. Um, it's basically the skin of newborn or prenatal sheep. Sounds kind of gruesome, um, but it's very pliant. <laughs> it's really <no> broken. <laughs> you can write on it. Uh, so, we're going to use a lot of words to consider all things cultural, the Greek writer Petarch, 
just a Macedonian here, is Pergamum right there in reference to uh, Greece. Here is an artist reconstruction of a uh, per, you know, tower of Pergamum. What it looked like. So we have a library right here. Uh, this is during the Roman period, so this is much later than the time period that we're talking about the Hellenistic uh, Kings. This is one of the rooms that contained part of the collection of the library of Pergamon. So we actually do have physical evidence of a library from this time period. It's just not in Alexandria, where we want it to be. Uh, beginning of the end. Um, I do want to get through this. I know we've got probably about five more minutes, and then we need to maybe introduce some QA. Um, some positive that Julius Caesar burned the library in Alexandria in 48 BCE during what, is, what he calls the Civil War between him um, and uh, the Egyptian forces. Uh, other suggested dates of the library, the library's destruction was one, the attack of Aurelian um, in 270 275. Um, Aurelian was kind of an idea, so I would not count that out. Um, Pope Theophilus, then once we get to the Christian period, Pope Theophilus of Alexandria um, agreed to destroy previous pagan knowledge in the name of the god that he believed in in 391. This is my, this, this is my argument. I, I think that this happened. But just because we have this destruction in 391 CE, doesn't mean the library disappears. It just means that the Obilus brought some pretty major damage. And, you know, and there were race riots as well. Race riots, uh, inflation, like tons and tons of stuff. Um, and then, of course, the Orientalist version, which I do not like, it's the last version, quote unquote, historically, is the Muslim conquest of Egypt. Um, so if the library was destroyed by Julius Caesar, it supports the story that Mark Antony gave the contents of the library of Pergamum to Cleopatra as a wedding gift to replace what Caesar had burned, or what Caesar had destroyed. The common theory about that is that it was books on the wharf that were destroyed. Right. Yeah. Because the library was too far from the sea too far to out. fit with the story, the legend about right. the Pergamum. Well, in, in, um, I noticed Gellis and uh, several other ancient authors say that uh, warehouses and books were burned. Right. They don't say the nature of the books, or we assume warehouses would be in there, near the harbor. But it doesn't say anything about the library. Right. It just says books. Well, if you're in an international port, you're going to have log books. You're going to have inventory lists. You know, um, various other things. You know, being stored in this area, possibly books that would eventually go to the library, but not necessarily the library itself. Good. Um, that's too much information. So, so Gia, we've already covered um, that. Manny was one of the historians that was asked by um, Ptolemy II um, to write a history of Egypt. And so Minito was actually an ancient Egyptian priest uh, and scribe. He had a lot of different books that are attributed to him. We don't have his original work called the Etidiaca, uh, or the History of Egypt. This work is essentially, essentially important to me as an Egyptologist and my colleagues, because this is where we get our sense of Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, a dynastic system of how Egyptian chronology was organized. It comes from this to from an ego. So he also wrote the book of Selfis, probably an astronomical uh, sacred book. Well, that's not fake. <laughs> um, the uh, epitome of physical doctrines, I think that sounds interesting, on festivals. Uh, the ancient religion and ritual, on ancient religion and rituals. Again, not very general at all. Uh, on the making of kaifu. Uh, which is a ritual type of ritual incense that was used in the Egyptian temples, which you can still find most people today. Um, and then my favorite, criticisms of Herodotus. You guys know me now, but I'm not a fan of Herodotus. Am I right? <laughs> so, um, 
I'll just like to make it up with this uh, personal paper, just, just because of that. Uh, Kalimikos. So, like I mentioned before, oh, I have time. Who's that? So, like I mentioned before, Kalimikos, he comes in, he's not like a major you know, scholar or anything, you know, but he basically compiles and organizes and restructures the organization of the library itself, uh, creating the bibliography in his work called Pianikis, which translates as lists. It's a longer title. So, what are our sources? Julius Caesar. So, the first authority on the burning of the library could come from Julius Caesar himself and his self authored work. Civil Wars. Achaeus uh, landed 200,000 troops in Alexandria to secure the city against Caesar and Cleopatra VII. Cleopatra VII was like 19 at the time, so you'll probably not be that much of a threat, uh, of a foreboding for real. Um, in the attempt to seize the warships in the port, Caesar apparently, um, and kill us, uh, Caesar apparently was the task of burning the ships in the port. The ship's masts purportedly fell into the city streets, and then the city streets caught fire, and that's when the Library of Alexandria burned down. Has anybody ever seen the class of 1963 movie, Cleopatra, with Elizabeth Taylor? Yeah. Remember when she comes in, and she's, you know, she, she faces down you know, Julius Caesar, and she's like, do you smell smoke? And she just completely goes off. She's like, how very dare you, any barbarian, set fire and destroy one human thought. That's not reported from the ancient you know, scripts or anything like that, but I think it's entirely fake that she she not buy that. Um, so he set fire to the ships. Supposedly, the ships fell into the city streets. Here's the story of Lomon is a tribute biographer of Caesar. Um, he is the historian of the Alexander the War. He provides a detailed strategy of gaining an upward hand in street to street fighting, including knocking down buildings and walls in order to gain the defensive. Why not burn them? Here is a quote. He cannot effect this purpose by burning the town for Alexandria was nearly um, safe against fire because the houses were built without wooden floorings and timber and were uh, made of masonry with vaulted arches and roofs which were made of rubble or paved uh, materials. So that kind of makes sense and kind of goes along the lines of what Eric was saying earlier about how flammable was Alexander? Not very. Um, Egypt is not known for its wood. To be honest, there would be very few wooden elements in any sort of um, domicile, uh, you know, whether it's domestic or royal or you know, an administrative building or whatever. Um, very, very few elements, certainly not enough to you know, cause this massive fire. Uh, almost the whole city of Alexandria was excavated and contained cellars which were connected to the Nile systems. By these means, water were uh, brought into private houses, and gradually, in a certain time, the water became clear and the mud subsided. There is no mention of the burning of books, the library, or the museum. He mentions the battle, but he doesn't mention anything about the books. Cicero, another one of my personal favorites, <clears throat> he's an accomplished Roman orator, um, hated Caesar. Um, and uh, fought against, uh, extensively against Caesar's campaign in Gaul, um, his adventures in Egypt, and of course his particular romance with Cleopatra, whom uh, Cicero called a whore and a witch, because she had is, she is ensnared you know, the great general, the general that he hates. So he's going to castigate her, right? but not go against Caesar necessarily. And if the library were burnt under Caesar's occupation during this civil war of the Alexandrian Wars, Caesar would be the first dude to say, Caesar did it. He destroyed you know, 300 years of collective knowledge. 
Cicero would accept that he got it. There is no mention of the garden of books, the library, or the museum. Strabo, a dude. The only mention sees a reference to the military devastating the island of Ferris with the lighthouses. He does not mention a fire or near the royal court where the library would have been located. The library was considered to be royal property, personal, private, and royal property, subsidized by the state. It was not a public library. Of the museum, Strabo mentions the director is appointed by Augustus, so Augustus, the first Roman emperor. Um, alone among the priesthood. The museum, the garden, and palace of the temple, and the palace once was um, exclusive in the exclusive Woody County, the royal corporate district, now open to the public. So, very early on in the Roman occupation of Egypt, the library is not just an exclusive property of scribes and scholars, it's now open to everybody. So, if you were a farmer, it just might happen. Know how to read and write. You can go into the library. He also describes the Soma, the circular mausoleum of Alexander and the Ptolemies. And again, this is 300 years after Alexander's death. So you know, we still have like, this massive monumental mausoleum that is, you know, contains the body of uh, Alexander the Great as well as all of the other members of the Ptolemy family. There was no mention of a library, likely because there was no separate building. Strabo is just talking about the museum. And like I said earlier, about 17 hours ago, um, more than likely the building structure of the museum also contained the library. The library is a collection, not necessarily an institution in and of itself, independent of the museum. Uh, I'm going to have to, sorry, please tag us. Basically, we can all assume that from here on out, nobody mentions anything about party books, libraries, or museums. Uh, there is a <laughs> Okay, so this, this is going to sum it up for a moment, and then I'll, I'll jump ahead to the area. So, as the account of the fire is repeated, so two are its consequences, ever more disastrous. So basically, drama builds over time. In the first century, Seneca mentions the loss of 40,000 books. And I can't even think that that's probably what Eric was referring to, that books were burned. Not library books, necessarily. It could be books that were along the harbor, because the library was located further inland. In the second century, C.E. Alan Skelis um, mentions that the uh, um, damage of burned books was 700,000 which borders the entire collection, the estimated entire collection of the Great Library. In the third century, Diocasius, the loss of books of the greatest number and excellence, um, because it was number. Uh, in the fourth century, Amianus, the burning of a priceless library and 700,000 books. So Amianus actually agrees, you know, kind of with um, Elvis Gillis. In summary, about time. Here's the library and museum are never mentioned together in only one or the other. Caesar speaks of the fire and not the library. Makes sense because if he did burn it, he's not going to write about it. Strabo, the museum, description, but not the fire. Seneca, the fire and the laws of books, but not specifically the library. Plutarch, the library, but not the books. <laughs> Diagrasius, the fire and the library, but not the museum. <laughs> um, Flores, the fire but not the library, or its books. What do you see, Flores? Come on. Um, and then Appian, neither the fire, library, or books, only the Battle of Alexandria. <laughs> Those are our sources. And it's the first character. I hope you are looking for absolute answers tonight. <laughs> um, I do want to um, end with Hathasia, and then of course a small tribute to Chelsea. Um, 
Hadisha was one of our last scholars associated with the library. Her father, Pham, was an astronomer and a uh, mathematician, as was she. She was also um, a neoplatonist. Um, Neoplatonic theory is kind of sort of based on Plato and his idea of ideal forms. Right? The divine is, is pure and unadulterated, mere, mere reflections of, of the divine. So um, she was an about pagan uh, at the time of religious strife. We had Christians running around, so around 400 BCE, where Christians were Jews, were pagans still, all fighting and killing each other. Uh, we have the establishment of the Shulbrick of Alexandria, um, of Theophilus. Um, Amisha was also one of the first to study math, astronomy, and philosophy. The last known member of the museum was the mathematician and astronomer Bale, Amisha's father. And then Amisha continued the work, but she's not directly related to the library or, or the institution. Uh, there's not a lot of that's, that's going about. We don't even know who her mother is. Right? We don't really know the father. I've actually stated the birth of contested scholars on how that she was born in 27 BCE, but a lot of historians from the age of 50 to be more likely to be a test of mother's history. I wish she established herself as a philosopher in what is now known as the Neoplatonic school, a belief system in which everything emits from the one. Her study, her student, Synesius would eventually become a bishop in a Christian church and incorporate Neoplatonic principles that he learned from a literate woman, God forbid, in the doctrine of the Trinity. The public lectures would be popular, Andrew Krauss, um, Dunning Royal of Scholar, the lady made appearance around the center of the city, expounding the public for those who are willing to listen. On Plato or Aristotle, who philosopher Damasius wrote after her death. So, this is, uh, these are a few images that I've taken from the internet. This is from an artist in my early explains. Abisha is depicted as being a noble beauty. We also have Abisha being played by the actress Rachel Rice um, in the movie Akora. Which is about the life of Hypatia and this very turbulent time of paganism and early Christianity. Um, no disrespect, it's kind of a low budget film, it's a not in the film, not Spanish, um, but it's good. It's, it's definitely worth the watch. I've watched it several times, mainly because I love Hypatia. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, if you have ever seen The Good Place, um, which I'm obsessed with in the pandemic, Literally lasted it 23 times. Hypatia actually appears um, in the afterlife, and she helps, I mean, no spoilers, she actually helps to, fall, to solve the answer to the universe. And I think that that's a lovely way to kind of more or less a real life human woman who was brutally beaten. She was dragged from the chariot, she was stripped naked, beaten. Taken into a church, killed, and then her flesh was excoriated, scraped from her body by broken tiles, and then her body was burned. Oh. And these were Christians who did this. So, the final legends, um, we'll get here, and then of course, I'll show you some pictures. Um, the final legend doesn't occur until the 12th century. And this is about the Muslim invasion of Egypt. In 642, um, Amr ibn al um, came under the auspices of the Caliph Omar, the second Caliph of the Caliph in Baghdad, uh, to invade Egypt, um, to throw out the Byzantine Christians over there. Um, and Omar encountered. Um, you know, the problem with the library. And so he's like, okay, well, you know, we've got Alexandria secured, you know, everything's cool here, there's a lot of books. So what do we do with a lot of books? So he messages um, Omar, and of course, you know, this back in the day, flip phones, so it took a while. Um, he messages Omar, it takes about two months for the response to come back. 
And his initial question was, okay, well, we've, we've secured Alexandria, we've got bridges of Egypt, you know, what do we do with all of these books? And Omar the Caliph says, well, if they contain, if these books contain what is in the Quran, then they are superfluous. If they contain what is not in the Quran, then they are blasphemous. Proceed and burn them. That's the last story we have. But that was also written by Christian authors of the 12th century. What's happened during the 12th century? The Crusades. So obviously there's going to be this huge amount of anti-Orientalism, anti-Muslim um, rhetoric behind this. Um, so I, I, it's an interesting part of history. It's an interesting part of the, the history of the library. Um, but I, I call BS. Yes. It can easily explain it. This is the modern day Bibliotheca Alexandrina. So the library exists. It was built by a thing we all need to architectural firm. Um, in the form you know, in the form of a rising sun disk. So kind of to represent the rebirth of Alexandrian exceptionalism and scholarship. Is it true anywhere near the site of the water? We don't know. Uh, th this is right on the harbor, as you can see the water there. Um, we, we don't know exactly what the original uh, is. This is the interior. It's weird that it's It's primarily digital. Yeah. Uh, prior to the period. And then, of course, this is the Um, 
in, in this uh, institution. Yes. Hi, so with, uh, your, as an Egyptologist, so there's, uh, speaking to your uh, conception of collective memory, this is a really big year for you as an Egyptologist. Uh, anniversary of the bicentennial of the decipherment of Rosetta Stone and the centennial of the discovery of the king of the Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah. It, 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 and actually, it, it actually didn't correspond. Whenever I initially created this class, um, this was back in 2016, I really wasn't even thinking about the anniversary, to be honest. Um, but of course, you know, among the Egyptology and the you know, colleagues that I have, my um, husband calls them the mirror mirror. Um, you know, it's it's been nothing but you know Egypt and Tut and Rosetta Stone over the past year. Uh, I'm just I, I'm interested. My background is in the anthropology, so I do take a lot of profound interest in um, sociology, anthropology, you know, theoretical applications, uh, what we're seeing, uh, social histories. Uh, and I think Egyptology is moving in the right direction, and unfortunately, I'm evolving with that. And there's not that much struggle. I find it fascinating. Yeah, King Tut's mask is great. What does it tell us about the times he lived, or about his life? Twenty-two pounds of solid gold. That's pretty. But what does it really tell us about you know the two million people that he ruled over? You know that content. I'm more interested in those questions. But no, that, that's, that's a good question about the, the you know, kind of copies and it's, you know, awareness of knowledge. Um, Paul Box works. Yes, sir. How is it, uh, what you mentioned earlier, how is it determined that the scribes are making mistakes? Oh, we, we have plenty of mistakes. We actually even have what are called the schoolboy texts. But how do we know it? How, do, how is it determined? Because, because they're literally being corrected. Like, Oh, you know, a scribe, a scribe will write down, again, papyrus is expensive, so if you're talking about going to school every day, you're writing on a broken posture or a broken chip of limestone, and you're copying text, right, mimetic, just like you, know, you had mentioned and I mentioned earlier, you know, mimicry, copying. And so if you copy something wrong, or what you're copying is half decayed, then you're going to have to guess what that lacuna is. That blank space is. And we actually have these these ostraca where it's written in black and then in red ink, circled and the correct word is written in. Just like just like we had in elementary school or college. So yeah, we we, we, and, and we actually learn a lot about philology, um, about uh, pronunciation. I don't know what the ancient Egyptian language sounded like. And so if there is a spelling that is missing one letter, but then the correction adds another letter, then we're like, oh, okay, well, they're kind of close. This dude just made a mistake. So here is the correction, and this is probably how it should sound. So it does help us in, in our understanding of the evolution. You know, because I mean, the ancient Egyptian language has um, five different phases, you know, well over 4,000 years. Uh, the last phase is the Coptic language, which unfortunately is no longer considered to be a living language. It's the ancient Egyptian, the last phase of the ancient Egyptian language, written in Greek and used primarily by Egyptian Coptic Christians. So kind of the liturgical uh, instrument, the liturgical language, much like Latin, you know, up until Vatican II. Latin was used in mass in Catholic churches. Coptic was also used in the same way in Coptic Christian churches. Unfortunately, in the past several generations, um, there has been a lot of backlash, and um, Egyptian Christians are now uh, made to read their sacred texts, not in Coptic, but in Arabic. And so the last phase of the ancient Egyptian language died out about maybe 30, 40 years ago. What about it's Ethiopia? All about politics. What about Ethiopia? They can use Coptic text there. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ethiopia is, is a uh, different script. Okay. Um, and I don't know that much about Ethiopia, to be honest. Um, that, that's a good point, because Ethiopia also had you know, influence from the Nile Valley. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I, I don't know that much about the script. The situation with Celtic has actually gotten worse. It, it was relatively living until about 1680, and uh, uh, preserved liturgically, and, right. and then it, it died out. And then in the late 19th century, the Coptic Church of Egypt decided that the interest in the interest of pan-Orthodoxy uh, that they would modify their own pronunciation and writing of Coptic uh, to uh, to approximate closer to the Greek Orthodox, uh, to, to Greek, uh, in the hopes that this would uh, foster ecumenism and bring the churches together and so on, and it failed. And in the meanwhile, a lot of people have, uh, 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 for about 40 or 50 years, were using that neo-Coptic, so to speak, and uh, the old pronunciation of Coptic has uh, died out in that period, that recently. So, I mean, it's it's a, a whole um, cascade of tragedies in regards to Coptic, right? It's rather sad. And I think for that point, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, because ultimately, I think that that's what happened to the library. We had a couple of really bad, you know, people in positions of power, wars, um, the library, I don't think the library went up with a bang, I think it went up with a whimper. I think it was just, works were disseminated, you know, the last scholars, you know, the classical scholars, the pagan scholars, or even Christian scholars, just took what they could, and, or burned them, you know, it's, it's possible. The papyrus, um, papyrus burns, you know, a relatively normal temperature, but parchment, it's cured parchment. You know, scan those little cute baby. Papyrus actually has to be very, very hot for it to burn. Um, papyrus production uh, was almost brought to extinction by, I want to say, the third or fourth century. About the same time that people stopped writing on scrolls, they started writing on folded bits of parchment that they then bound in leather called a codex. And that's the ancestor of our book. So technology changes, um, availability changes. I mean, there's, as far as I know, you know uh, Dr. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember what he done his name. Um, go to Egypt, you buy papyrus, and he's like um, one of the main producers of papyri, uh, you know, painted for tourists and you know things like that. Which, which are perfectly fine, the language is good, the art is good, he has professionals doing this. I can't remember his name. Um, but he has this enormous farm outside of Cairo where he intentionally grows the native papyrus plant because it's very sparse throughout the rest of Egypt. Papyrus is basically overformed 2,000 years ago. That's why they made the change you know, in late antiquity and then during the medieval period to parchment. Um, because Papyrus was just, I mean, Papyrus was supplying the entire Roman world, right? And you're talking about all of North Africa, all of, you know, Western Asia, all of Europe, using this one material that comes from this one source, you are going to go for fun. Is it like placebo loss of the swamp? What's that? I thought we thought Papyrus was like placebo willows growing in swampy land, and so yeah, right? yeah. the elite plant that we got, the Nile Delta, which is which, which is swampy, it used to be at least. No, it, it, it's, it's very swampy. Because they're growing, growing wild all over the place? Um, in, in some places, yeah, because um, in ancient Egypt, you know, you've got the Nile corridor, uh -huh. and you do have areas of patchy swampiness. Uh -huh. uh, but then, of course, you've got the Nile Delta up near the right. um, Mediterranean, where it kind of branches out, right. and you've got a series of, you know, various canals, tributaries of the Nile River, emptying out to the Mediterranean. Um, so you're going to have a very, very wet climate. So is there an issue that the difference between cultivated, genetically modified papyrus if you just make paper and the wild stuff that's not that's utilizable? I'm not. I'm not sure about that. I don't know that much about okay. the genetically modified stuff. Like, um, but you've seen the Delta Road. Right. and then stripping and stripping and stripping them, laying them down, them laying them crosswise, pressing them, rolling them, waiting until they dry. It's easier. It sounds cruel, but it's easier just to kill a baby sheep. <laughs> well, 
there's a process there. There's a process there too. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's lime and things like scraping. Uh, uh, one of the factors in, uh, in papyrus, of course, it keeps better when dry. Right. And it, so Europe is much wetter than Africa. So papyrus, you, you will see it in, well, in Egypt, it's a perfect place for papyrus. But France, for example, with all its rivers, papyrus doesn't stand a chance there. So, uh, well, to, your, to your point, I should to both of your points. The Nile Delta, where it's closer to the Mediterranean and it is swampier, you know, it's almost like southern Louisiana, you know, you know very swampy. Um, we don't have, we have barely any pathological or even organic wooden materials from excavations in the Delta. Sure. But we do have them in the Nile Valley, where it's much drier. Right. Because you're away from the, that source of moisture. So, I don't know if there are any other questions? Um, Before anybody leaves, I'm going to hand out a few remarks if you don't have any of our own So, uh, you can see the facility. So, these are actually bookshop.org bookmarks. And if you go and scan this QR code using the camera on your iPhone, it'll pull up a link. You can buy books, and part of the proceeds will go towards heirloom, even though you're buying them online. So they're also bookmarks. So okay, we'll take use. And if there's anybody who's not familiar with the bookstore, we are an all volunteer, not for profit, awaiting our tax exemption. Our profits go to support two academic scholarships for indigent kids with the ability to benefit from the college and the woodworking scholarship. So if you haven't been to the store, please come and visit. Thank you, Rex. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.